Kevin has been nominated 20 times for the Academy Award for films like Transformers, Spider-Man, uh, Armageddon. Armageddon. You can read my handwriting better than I can. The Patriot, Days of Thunder. Wow. You like loud movies, don't you? And we've observed on the, crit on the pundit side that the Oscar voters tend to like that. And so that's why you're in really good shape with this war movie now, Boom, Boom, Bang, Bang. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say exactly they're in love with loud movies, <laughs> but the movies I tend to work on sometimes c tend to be loud. Okay. Right. You're doing movies about war, they get loud. Top Gun, and it was about jets, they were loud. Days of Thunder, there were cars, they were loud. Armageddon, it was an asteroid, it was loud. Uh, <laughs> I did do a film once called Memoirs of a Geisha. They got nominated for an Oscar, and I remember them that year they were comparing the sound of King Kong to the sound of Memoirs of a Geisha, and they were talking about how great the sound design was on King Kong, which I agree with, and then they were talking about this, the sound of the uh, kimono in the Memoirs of a Geisha, and I thought, wow, okay, we'll take that. <laughs> how, what was the challenge you faced, the biggest one with this film? Are you talking about Hacksaw? Hacksaw, okay. Right, because you've... you've <coughs> Done war movies before. Right. Well, um, first of all, uh, Hacksaw was uh, a, a, about one of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific. It was the Battle of Okinawa, in which 80,000 80, uh, men died in like four months, three and a half months on, on this one battle. And uh, the way that Mel Gibson shot it was pretty graphic because the war was graphic. Um, our challenge was to step up to the plate and, and put the viewers on that battlefield with Andrew Garfield and uh, Luke Bracey and uh, Vince Vaughn and the guys. And, uh, you know, if, if, for those of you who don't know much about what we do, um, the, uh, in Hacksaw Ridge, the battle scenes, uh, the production sound was basically unusable because the guns sound like cap guns and the uh, explosions sound like firecrackers going off because they're just props. So everything on the production side is stripped out, you know, and most of the dialogue was unusable, too, because of uh, all the sounds of production. So that had to be replaced. So um, the first battle scene is about 10 minutes, and there's no music in it. Uh, so the entire battle had to be scored with sound effects, uh, which sounds easy, but it's not. You have, to keep, you have to keep the energy going the whole time. You have to know when, and when to play sound effects and when not. Uh, the so, you know, you, you, you've got like 300 explosions going on and about 800 rifles going on, and they all have to sound a little different uh, so that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the viewer doesn't get tired of hearing the same old sounds over and over again. And um, the actors were, uh, were acting at a 10 the entire time. The intensity in these actors was uh, uh, amazing. So uh, we felt uh, on the sound side, and one of the things I'd just like to say is that what I do, I don't do by myself. I, I'm surrounded by a huge team of uh, very talented sound people. Uh, Rob McKenzie was our sound designer and Andy Wright. Uh, these guys, I worked with them down in Australia and these guys were amazing, talented sound guys who, who took those battle scenes and made you feel like you're right there on that battlefield. And, uh, and, and I would say that you know, stepping up to make the film sound as cool as Mel made it look was our biggest challenge. These battle scenes are complicated because the, 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 the general conceit of this film is you wouldn't believe it if, you, if it wasn't true. The fact that this conscience objector, uh, played by Andrew Garfield, is so opposed to violence that he's refusing to carry a gun during World War II, but he's going to go in to these, to these action battle scenes and help out. And he ends up saving 70 soldiers in the most spectacular way that you've ever seen. And, and so what you're doing up on that screen in charge of the sound mixing and, 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 and it all is fascinating because you've got this terrifying experience, this war going on, and this redemptive experience going on with him saving lives, but yet you're involved in the inner trauma of his life and death struggle, but yet this bigger thing, and, th and then there's the whole thing on the ground that's going on with all the, uh, back at the camp with the, and the retrieving these soldiers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is uplifting, wonderful, inspiring stuff while the world's going to hell. Uh, a lot of that we attribute to Rupert Gregson Williams who did the score. Uh, he knocked this one out of the park. He had a very short amount of time to do that. Uh, I arrived down in Sydney uh, I, the third week of June, which was the same day that he was hired to do the score. We started finaling, uh, doing our final mix four weeks later. Uh, so uh, that, and, and, and you know, we can, we can handle the heavy artillery, but you know, when, when Desmond, uh, Andrew Garfield starts carrying those men to safety, the part that tugs on your heart is the part that Rupert added, which is the emotional thread that uh, his music contributed to it. 
And uh, part of our challenge was to know when to back off on the sound effects and play the music. There's three distinct battles. The first battle that has no music, the second battle that has score, and the third battle is more like an opera. And uh, in each one uh, we handle differently. Uh, when uh, the second battle we leaned heavily, uh, le leaned, it was sort of a balance between music and score, leaned a little heavier on the score. The third battle was more lyrical, it was like an opera, and we just, Rupert just went crazy with it, and, and he did an amazing job, and the sound effects are just really playing stylized underneath all of his music during that third battle. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, he did a fantastic job capturing the emotion uh, that Andrew Garfield uh, gave to the character. When is it in the movie, I don't remember a scene specifically, that the, the silence in the battle scene was more important than the, the noise? In other words, like the Kimona uh, example that you just used, the fluttering of something right. very, very quiet. There's a scene where uh, Andrew Garfield is at the top of the ridge and everyone's bailing off the ridge because uh, it, it, it's pointless. They're, they're not going to achieve their goal. Uh, everyone's kind of surrendering down the ridge. And he looks up uh, as if he's speaking to God, and he says, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And at this point, the, all the explosions sound surreal behind him. The music takes over, and, uh, and, and he kind of gets the message. He hears, a, uh, he hears a, a soldier off on the battlefield screaming for help. Uh, and just a little point, sorry, uh, th when that happened, you know, Mel's big on bringing people on the stage in and saying, hey, you want to be in the movie? And, and we set up a microphone, we put him in. The craft services guy was delivering our food, and Mel says, you want to be in the movie? And he goes, sure. He steps up to the mic and yells, help! And that's the guy he, that Andrew Garfield hears when he decides to go back into the battle. Anyways, that's just a side story. Um, but that's the moment. Uh, that that's the moment where we take out all the sound effects, we play them very stylized, and then uh, and then uh, Andrew decides to jump back and, and go save those seventy five men, which he was credited for, by the way. And also, the story seems a little over the top. Like, did he do all that? Well, actually, they had to dumb it down because this guy was so brave. He actually, after he got his uh, leg blown off, he had to, he jumped off the uh, stretcher to go help another guy that he thought was in worse shape than him. I mean. He is the, truly, this guy was a, a real American hero. Last question. Uh, Kevin is a sound mixer, so that means, explain what that means. That's well, what I do is uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to uh, work with all the stuff that these guys give to us uh, and the sound designers. Um, I sit in a, in, a, in a giant room as big as a theater, and we have a big mixing console in the middle, and we have the sound. Every single sound that's in the movie is on a fader in front of us. So each character's dialogue is on a fader. We have the score broken off into food groups. So we've got the orchestra, percussion, choir, guitars, every little bit of the orchestra section off. And then every single sound effect in the movie, including the footsteps, the gunshots, the rickshaw, every single sound. And we sit there and we balance that whole s movie soundtrack. If we took all the faders and just put them up at a zero, it would sound like a train wreck. So our job is to sort of balance it all out. And, and the way we sort of do that is we sort of start with the dialogue. We get all the dialogue sounding uh, right and comfortable levels. Then uh, we back the music in around that and then the sound effects around that. And then we sit with the director, the film editor, and all the other um, you know, gang on the stage and decide what's important. When do we play this? When do we play that? You know. Um, stuff like that. This other movie you have, you could be nominated for Passengers. This is uh, a space opera. This is, again, uh, big scenes where quiet is important, but also um, these very, very theatrical scenes where they're um, on the edge of the spaceship looking at infinity. And uh, what w let, Let's talk about the challenges of that film that you faced. Right, uh, Passengers, a, a 180 from Hacksaw Ridge, right? Uh, two completely different... Uh, uh, approaches to sound. Uh, when I first saw the first cut of Passengers, it was uh, three actors running around a green screen set for uh, the entire movie. It was nothing but green screen uh, because they hadn't developed the ship yet. They hadn't decided what it was going to look like. And the ship is called the Starship Avalon, and it's this futuristic spaceship that takes you from one planet to the other on a 120-year journey where you're put into a hibernation pod, and you sleep for the whole journey except for the last four months you wake up. And, uh, and what happened is, uh, you know, Chris Pratt's pod malfunctions, you know, 20 years into it, and he wakes up and realizes, shoot, I'm going to be on this ship for the next 90 years by myself. And, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the um, challenge in that movie is this, this spaceship 
is so sexy and so futuristic and so cool looking that, you know, I, I, once again, I worked with this very incredibly uh, talented sound designer named Will Files who had to give a voice to that spaceship, you know. Uh, it, it, the whole spaceship, it talks to you when you walk in a room, it lets you know that you've gotten there. Uh, uh, all of the different aspects of the, um, of the spaceship are all automated. Uh, so, and it, like I said, it talks to you. There's robots that serve you food. There's robots that serve you breakfast. And all of those, uh, all of those uh, creatures had to have a voice. And it had to sound futuristic, but not like they're futz, like they're coming over a telephone. So it was, that was a little bit of a challenge. But uh, you know, it's a sci-fi love story. And so we had to be very delicate in the way that we handled the sound. Uh, and uh, Tom Newman uh, did the score, who's incredible. Everyone knows Tom's fantastic. And, and his score drives uh, that film in a, in a very emotional and terrific way. And like I said, Will Files and his gang did a great job on the sound design for the ship to make you believe you're really uh, up there on this, uh, on this fantastic spaceship. And by the way, it stars the biggest movie star in the world, Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> She's not too bad to look at either. Yeah. In, the, in, in the movie, that's going to be the hottest movie around Christmas. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.